um, because quite a lot of people think that 50 years is too long to commemorate anything. Obviously, they haven't heard of Remembrance Day or 1916 or 1788, and the, the false curfew is only 50 years away. So I think commemorating that event, which the curfew is a pivotal event in what's called modern Irish history, because it led to three or four things which still have a resonance today, 50 years later. Uh, and we also wanted to say thank you to the people who defended the false road uh, that weekend. And we're talking not just about the auxiliaries or the FINA or coming them on or the IRA unit. We're also talking about the local people who came out to build barricades, who came out to do just that, uh, who came out, built barricades to try and stop the Brits from coming down the side streets and so on. Uh, and in a sense, it was that that made it a pivotal event in history because it was local people more than anybody who was out on the streets that day. And again, in 1970, against overwhelming odds, 3,000 British soldiers against what really was about 90 people who were armed. That was the auxiliaries, the FENA, the coming them on, and the local unit of the IRA. But also, Robo tells me uh, that there was a lot of local people who had firearms, sailors from Southampton, who, well, Robo would know about that because he'd done a bit of smuggling, you know, but people who were not attached to anything, but yet who were armed and out fighting as well. Uh, and I also, I want to say that to commemorate something that happened is not to glorify the violence that went on that weekend. There is no justification for glorifying violence. But there is, it is appropriate and it's dignified to commemorate what I said is a pivotal event in modern Irish history. When armed Irish Republicans, for the first time since 1916, really stood their ground and said, we are not going to be intimidated by the armed forces of the state or by the Unionists. Because the reality was the British Army was asked to do what they did by the Unionist Party. Uh, and the people who stood fighting this weekend were actually, there's my thing on, were actually fighting against violence, not changing the themselves. <laughs> well, okay. Anyway, so the Republicans who defended this area that weekend, in my personal view and in the view of many other people, were actually role models because they reinforced one of the core beliefs of republicanism which is that you cannot uh, the state cannot repress working class communities and expect that those communities will not resist them in some way and that was one of the big lessons from the civil rights movement that you cannot repress an entire population without them fighting back so four civilians were murdered that weekend uh, there's no need to announce their names, they're in the paper. But that was the first massacre, really, of Irish civilians and what people like to call the Troubles. And the fact that the RUC made absolutely no attempt to investigate the murders led directly to the other massacres in Bally Murphy and Spring Hill and in Derry. And I suppose in some senses, how could the RUC actually investigate murders committed by the British Army? when they themselves, just a year previously, had machine gunned this community and killed a nine-year-old and also a man in Davis Flats. Not one cop spent a day for that, those two murders and not one soldier has ever spent an hour inside jail for the massacres that occurred both during and after the curfew. So the British Army actually became immune from prosecution as a result of the activities during the curfew itself. Uh, and even today they still seek that immunity whenever anyone questions them they say it's a witch hunt well I mean if you kill 14 people or 15 people on the street and people want you charged for it they call it a witch hunt a witch hunt is the cream I say so the other thing that, that the curfew actually did was it actually reinforced the message to quite a lot of people that the Northern Ireland state was not reformable uh, and that undermined the credibility of the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association, which itself was dealt a death blow in Derry uh, after the massacre. There hasn't been a civil rights march in Northern Ireland since the massacre at Derry.
The other thing that it undermined was was the belief of the Republican movement that armed uh, armed actions are no good without the consent of the people. And the people like Gould and Carl and McMillan and so on, who throughout the 60s had developed uh, and renewed the Republican movement and its understanding that physical force would not achieve anything. Uh, and just as it failed in the 30s, the 40s and the 50s, the recent campaign of the Provost has also failed to achieve that objective. Today it's administered, Northern Ireland is administered as simply another part of the British state. So how the Provost can say that they won a war is beyond me. The only thing I'd like to say is, although the falls remained actually sealed off, by midday on Sunday the 5th of July, women had begun to gather at various parts of the city in order to march to the falls area. And those women were organised in various districts. The provost would have, have you believe that Mura Drum organised 3,000 women and marched down the Falls Road. She certainly didn't, you know, fair play to her, she was there. The other thing is that the British knew that most of the armaments had been moved out uh, before the cordon was actually effective, but still women with proms were moving guns out uh, whenever the uh, curfew was actually lifted on the Sunday. And I remember some people tell me that when they got to the top of Leeson Street and the bottom of Sultan Street, the, so the soldiers were so totally unprepared for the women that they thought the bottles of milk they had were for them and started battling them. <laughs> so those type of women are a special breed themselves. So just to finish off, and Ruben wanted me to, 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 to say about one of the incidents uh, when a woman was taking guns down towards Devis Flats and the rifle actually, the, the muzzle of the rifle actually came out and James, he was walking with her. His face went quite red whenever the soldier turned around to take a look at what she said was not more than a toy. So, in conclusion, remembering our history is the foundation of culture and identity and that identity is actually strengthened the more you share it with other people. And we remember and honour those who sought to defend us uh, with that memory. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, the day was really part of a wee history project that we had started two years ago, which went into abeyance, uh, which hopefully will be revived. So it's not party political. It's just remembering the people and the curfew. Folks, if anybody read the Only Town News on Thursday, a lot of people were disappointed at what we had put in, quite rightly so, because we spent weeks and weeks doing this, and weeks and weeks running up the Only Town News. I got the other, he says right, he printed it all. He cut it all out. He put what he wanted. So we had to get Patsy Dunlop yesterday to put our statement on his, what's it, on his Facebook page, isn't it, Leo? Uh, it's on Memories of the Falls. Memories of the Falls. And as I say, the only town news just cut it to ribbons. So people look at it and say, is that all they can do? Read what's on Patsy's. I can't do Facebook and neither can him. And this is a problem. There's very few people here today because we didn't know how to get it up on Facebook. But if you go on Patsy's website, you'll see our full statement and what it was about and what it said. It's about 10 times longer than the only town news. As Jordy says, it took them four days to read it. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, uh, if you've, I'm not on Facebook, but if you're any interested on it, get on Patsy Dunlop's Facebook. 